Just a bloke in a bar. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Bloke in a Bar. I am here with 250, nay, 249 game veteran Dean Hallitow. How's it going, brother? How's it going, bro? Thanks for reminding me. I get, <laughs> I get reminded about it all the time, particularly from some of my mates at work. They, yeah. Uh, yeah, they like to. I haven't played one game, but they'll still. I mean, it's, it's terrible coming for me. I played fucking 42 games. Literally, you've played 207 more games than me, and I have the audacity, and I'm a winger. <laughs> I tell you what, if I said that 10 years ago, I'd probably get knocked out. Now, all respect to anyone who's played one game in first grade, yeah. but um, to, to miss out on the 250 hurt a little bit. Yeah. John Scandalis played 249 games in the NRL, like for the Tigers yeah. and for West. So when we missed out on the year that I retired, we could have made the finals. Yeah. I might have played 250. Uh, but he was, I wouldn't say he was hoping we'd miss the finals because he's a Tiger through and through. Oh, yeah, yeah finals, a bit of banter. That was a bit of a um, yeah, silver lining for him to, to bag me out and say yeah. I didn't make the 250. Who's the most capped players from Tiger? Uh, Robbie, Robbie Farah, Benji, uh, Chris Hyington would be up there. No, but it's in like... For the Tigers. For the Tigers, yeah. yeah. Those, well, those, those three. Oh, be, wow. Oh, because it's a merger club, so it's less Sorry, history. for the West Tigers. Yeah, yeah, yeah For yeah, the West Tigers, Tigers, it would be those three. Yeah, wow, okay. For Balmain or West, I, I'd struggle yeah. to sort of figure out. Who that Older was. clubs and that. But um, do you is do you look back, what's interesting, and I'm sure you have, do you look back on any one game and go, you know what, I probably could have played that game, but I was a bit injured or whatever? Oh, no, I tried to get on the field as much as I could okay, when okay. I was injured, but... There's a couple of games where I only played a few minutes where you can almost not count them because I was on the field. Nah, count them, bro. You want to be looking at any, <laughs> any way you can pull them in. Pull yeah. them in, bros. No, but the end of the two, 2015 season, so I played, my last year was 2016. Yep. And I played all but one game in 2016 and that was the first game of the, the season because I got suspended. Oh, uh, My no. first suspension, first and only suspension while playing was uh, from round 26 in 2015. Was it a, a just suspension? Yeah, I got no? two charges in one game. So oh, wow. It, okay. was, um, it was definitely a week. It was against the Dragons, actually. Yeah. Um, one was a shoulder charge, low-grade tra- shoulder charge and a high shot. Okay. Um, so, yeah, look, I deserve to be suspended. But, oh, my um, God. And I might have got injured in the first game of the year. Who knows? Yeah, it's so true. Eh? It's, it's like, yeah, you don't know. To, it could go either way. Try not to do sliding doors, yeah. Mate, that's... Uh, but I mean, 249. I'm pretty sure you can be happy with that. Yeah, no, 249. Still, <laughs> yeah, it's still, still fucking good. incredible, yeah, bro. Yeah. Um, you know, season is upon us. The season is upon us. Would you say... You know, obviously you have love for the Bulldogs and you've got love for the Tigers. When you, when the it's about to kick off, yeah. who's the team that you're sitting there going... This is my team. No, look, I, to be honest, I, I've over the last four years since I've since I finished up, um, I found it hard to follow anyone like real passionately. I mm. love the Tigers and I love the Bulldogs, as you say, but uh, and I want to see them both do well. But mm. I, I don't. I find myself more a fan of the game now, so I don't mm, really same. sit there and go, "Oh, I'm, I want this team to win, or I want that team to win," or I'm, I'm passionately behind one team. I just love watching footy. Like I, mm. I, um, I really. You know, admire the way the guys play the game now and, mm. and the girls are in the game obviously as well. So I admire the way the game's grown and um, love watching the game itself. So it's really hard for me to follow anyone. Mate, uh, you mentioned the girl, the women's game. Um, it's so interesting. Like I, I grew up and I thought I was like a pretty good guy. Like, you know, treat everyone equally, all that kind of stuff. But there's so many like blind spots that you don't see. Like, for example, I grew up and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be an athlete. Like, of course I'm going to be an athlete. And you don't even think, obviously you're young, you're not expected to do things, but you don't even think, a girl that's my same age, she doesn't think that. She's not allowed, like, not that she's not allowed, but there's no the opportunity. Opportunities weren't there, yeah, right. So it wasn't yeah. even put in her head. Yeah. And so even so, even that, you're like, okay, that's, you know, shit that I was thinking that or not, not thinking of them, even though I'm young. But then even further, like, when the women's footy kicks off, you know, I was like, yeah, I probably won't enjoy that. Like, you know, I'm just being honest. I'd sit there and go, I probably won't enjoy it. And again, surprised at how, quick, how quickly they've adjusted and learned and you watch the first women's game to now, it's a totally different game. And it just proves that given the opportunity, as you said earlier, like the opportunity, if you give it to them, it can become exciting. It can become a genuine product that makes money for the girls and the women and everyone else involved, um, as well as being an exciting product for the fans as well. Yeah, the, the women's game, like you say, has grown a lot in the, in the short, it's short history, really. It's, it is a short history Absolutely. for the game. There's definitely been... Uh, women that have played the game and trailblazers that have played the yeah. game for a number of years. So the game's been around, but those opportunities to play at an elite, elite level, to get the the in-depth coaching that they might get at an elite level as mm. well, it never existed before. Like you say, when you were younger, that that, that opportunity didn't exist for, for girls your age. And mm. oh, I've got two daughters. My, my oldest daughter's just started getting into, into footy. She's playing league tag and mm. um, she really likes it. And, and I'm 
stoked that for her, there's going to be role models that she can look up to. And if she wants to play the game when she's older, I'll be like really supportive of that and Mm. grateful that she's got the opportunity to. And the same for my for my younger girl as well. Like Mm. she she maybe want to get into to rugby league. She plays a bit of touch footy at the moment, but she's sort of half interested. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, without the opportunity that now the NRLW is is showcasing, they they don't get that chance. Totally. And I and as I said, like it's so, it's so. For me personally, on a selfish perspective, it's like so interesting to see how many blind spots you do have. Like you think you're a good person. Like, yeah, I'm a good person. Like, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And, but it's just a blind spot that you weren't really like at no point in my childhood did I ever think how shit is it that a girl is doesn't have the, the she, not that she has to be an athlete, but she doesn't even have that thought in her head because she, no one's given her the opportunity to have that thought. Yeah. There's been no role. We haven't, you know, provided opportunities for role models to exist. Now they do exist. Um, and so, yeah, I think the, I think the women's game, um, the, the, how far it's come in such a short space is so good. And I, and I do know that when I have daughters, I'm going to be so grateful for all the trailblazers and yep. all the, the women that have come and done the hard yards for no, no repayment. Like yep. they didn't get paid for it, didn't get any spotlights. So. They had to pay their own way to go to exactly. a tournament, which was time off work, having to pay to go overseas for a mm-hmm. tournament. Like that, that's actually pretty tough, right? Incredible. Incredible. And, and, there's, and there's still women now that, that have to, they give up their time to play the NRLW mm. uh, from, from possibly their, their normal jobs and um, they're losing that income. Yes, they're getting a contract from their NRLW club, but it's still time away from work, which mm. you rely on the generosity of 100%. their bosses and, and whatnot. Uh, they might have family commitments that they've also got to park for a period as well. So yep. um, it's, it's funny yeah, you say about the blind spots that, that you kind of, you, so you don't know what you don't know, but, Absolutely. but also um, yeah, it, it is great to see that the game's been proactive, but mm. we're also seeing um, women on staff is going to probably change that as well. I mm. think the more and more we see women in, um, coaching roles mm. or in high performance roles yep. uh, and, and administration roles within the game, uh, it'll create even bigger opportunities. Yep. Not just playing. Mm, abs- no, I totally agreed. I, I, it's been interesting because um, you know we, we have about thirteen percent of women that follow like bloke in a bar, um, and it's increasing, which is which is a good sign. Um, what I find interesting, it's a different sport, and and also again, I remember when MMA started and Dana White was like, no, nah, like we're not going to have women MMA. Um, and even when the first fights, you know, became announced that, you know, honestly, I was like, I'm not going to be interested in that. Like, I'm, I just, I don't see the, it's just not, doesn't uh, interest me. Now I look back, uh, now, now Amanda Nunes and um, Yoana Young Jacek, they are literally two of my favorite fighters. Um, and so again, that blind spot, you, you don't know what you don't know. You know what I mean? Very skilled, right? You, I'm not a huge MMA person, yeah. but there's a lot of skill involved in MMA, 100%. right? And then there's a, there's a heap of physicality. Oh. And then there's also that, that fear factor of like, I'm about to go into mm. a cage where I cannot get out of until I tap yep. or I get knocked out. Well, it's a good example because like, if there's one sport that stereotype says that they won't be able to do, it was MMA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, Amanda Nunes was co-main event on one of the biggest cards of the year. So it just proves that like there's so many areas where we think, oh, that's not possible, and then it becomes possible. So a uh, bit of a tangent there, but I, yeah, I just no, find it so interesting. You, tangent, you, right. you work at the, the NRL with, for cultural? Well, uh, I work, my, my role at the NRL's changed. So I, I was in wellbeing and education, and, and mm. a big part of that was working with um, players of Pacifica background, so helping support them mm. off the field, developing leaders. Um, but generally, I work with the whole playing group. Um, I just had a bit of a, a passion to sort of try and create opportunities or make mm. sure that we're – um, create an environment where those guys are well supported uh, okay. and, and girls also. So, um, yeah, that was a big part of my role. I'm now in a, in a different role where I'm, I'm spending time working in every department. Um, mm. Luckily enough, I get the opportunity to learn as much as I can about the whole business um, yep. and then uh, hopefully progress upwards or outwards to a club and, and, and pick up a bigger role. So okay. um, that's where I'm at at the moment. I still will put my hand up to do anything where we're supporting players and yep. um, yeah, particularly with uh, Indigenous and Pacific players, making mm. sure that those – um, pathways and, and the opportunities that they have are well supported as, as well. What's been a player or a situation where you've gone, you know what, this is why I do that? Like a player where you've helped him with this, that, or, or, or a female player where you've been like, this is why I do this? Um, it's hard to pinpoint anyone. Like it's anytime you, you, you chat to a player, you help a player, like you, a lot of our people that work out in clubs, in wellbeing roles, for instance, they might deal with players that are going through some, um, some tough periods and everyone goes through tough times. It mm. doesn't matter whether it's um, the gear steward in under 16s or the CEO, you know, everyone yep. goes through absolutely bad times, right? Yep. You know that. 
Um, but for those people to be working day to day with players that are in a high pressure environment where there's a lot riding on it for, for most individuals, for them to be able to help them through a tough time um, is definitely rewarding for them. So mm. um, when I know or hear about stories from, from wellbeing staff at clubs, because that's who, in my role, I support a lot of, um, or in my previous role, I supported those staff members mm. as much as I could. And um, if I heard stories about a player that's been through a bad patch and then you see them performing yeah, totally. on a weekend and totally. having a you know, a really good run of form and, and getting a contract extension where, you know, there might have been some, some issues in the past that yeah. they've, they've dealt with. And that's rewarding in itself, yeah, to be able to see Absolutely. them turn a corner, mm. get some success and then, um, you know, go on and make a good career for themselves. Absolutely. I mean, that's the that's what you want really. Like yeah. that's the, I guess that's the end goal, you know, sort the, you know, the mental space out and then get them to play as much games as they can really and not just like the mental space with like well-being and education it's about yeah. education's a, a massive part of it so yeah mental health and well-being is is really important we want all of our players to be um you know sound bo uh, body and mind and mm. uh, also off the field you want them to be engaged in something for, for post football like look at yourself like you've you've turned yourself into this this brand this <laughs> business that's got a fairly big presence in, yeah. in like culture culture in australia but also in sport yeah. and um, just generally in, in Aussie culture and mm. to be able to do that after your playing career is, is pretty enormous and that's something that our people in wellbeing education will look at and go good on him for for following having the conviction to follow what he wanted to do and, mm. the, and the determination to, to see it through to, to the business you got now so that's another rewarding thing I guess it would see players that study mm. or have something that they're interested in away from footy turn that into a successful transition out of the game totally like I think one of the biggest pleasures I get is seeing, and again, I'm not the only reason they do it, just maybe a tiny bit, is seeing some ex-players or current players starting their own little businesses, yeah. like seeing bloke in a bar and going, well, you know, and I'm just being honest here, like he wasn't the biggest player, he had a relatively small career, um, and yet it seems that bloke in a bar is going really well. Um, maybe I should give it a crack, you know. Yeah. Clearly it can work. Clearly I, I'm more than a footy player. And, you know, we've seen it heaps, you know, you've got the – with Tony Zelezniak brothers doing the, the, uh, watches, the watches. Yeah, yeah. We've got Chad Townsend starting to sing. We've got YKTR. We've got Ponga and that doing the 257 stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that's being done, which is sick. To, I, I love seeing it. Yeah. And that's and that's like in this, in, in your field around branding and yep. um, you know, content creation. And mm. and there's guys doing, guys and girls doing stuff you don't even in know totally about different fields, right? Totally, that, that, totally. Yeah. Actually, there's, a, there's a, one that always jumps out to me is Justin Olam, come from PNG, grew up in. In PNG, yeah. he's coming into the game and he's big dog. I love him, bro. I, I, I love I him. love the way he plays. You, you wouldn't 100. meet a more fearless player in the game, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and he plays the game so well. He's got a, a degree in applied physics, I think it is. What? Yeah. So he studied when he was back in um, back in PNG. He got his degree, and he's tossing up whether or not he goes on and does a masters or does another degree. But bro, not many people would know that. I did not know that. Justin Olin, this wrecking ball that comes tearing in on a hard inside uh, under his line off one of his half shoulders, off monster shoulder, monster shoulder whoever yeah, it is yeah. he's running off. But, you know, like he's... He has a degree guy. in applied physics. Applied physics, yeah. Holy fuck. <laughs> That's incredible. And he plays it plays it down too. He doesn't talk about that stuff too much. Like out here now, bro. Yeah. It's out here now, bro. <laughs> that is... Um, just, that's just one example, right? Wow. Um, I'm so fucking impressed right now. <laughs> that's fucking amazing. Because like... He's a maniac. Yeah, he's a maniac. You know, like if you, if but you if know what, it's the stereotype he's, he's thing. He's applying physics, well. right? He understands about. Yeah, he understands about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Science, speed, all that sort of but stuff. But like, so. you look at him, like you, you would look at him, and you go, okay, aggressive footy player. There's no way he's going to be a thinking man. Yeah. Um, that's the stereotype. Just like we're talking about stereotypes before, you know, like with blind spots you don't see, you don't see, and then you find out he's doing applied physics. Yeah. That's great. An, an incredibly intelligent man. Like that come from like it was impressive enough that he'd come from PNG. Yeah. Move through the system the way he did. That's wow, that's incredible. That's <laughs> it's just a thing. Like, next time someone gets showed by him, they're like, Wow, he's also he got calculated a that. Yeah, he <laughs> calculated that I was about to get that's why he's such a good tackler. Yeah, yeah. he is. You know what? He's not sitting there trying to hurt anyone, he's literally just done the math as he's resetting the line. And he's realized that if I move at certain velocities, I'm going to dominate that. He, guy. Didn't, even, he didn't even have to put much effort into it. It just Mate, happened. How good, you know, what's crazy is he was one of my, I think he was the most underappreciated center in the game last year. Yeah, no, it's top three cool. center in the game. Very Absolutely, cool. he was because like when you see players like that that are really aggressive, a lot of the time you'll go, okay, he'll make bad reads in defense every now and then, not all the time, because he's so aggressive. His reads in defense were nearly perfect. Yeah, ball like obviously you know everyone makes errors. I made a million of them, but um, his defense was so strong and aggressive, and his ball running every time he ran the ball. 
He would make yards. You have to put if you're going to tackle him, you have to be ready to make a hard tackle, or else he's bumping you. Mate. And then defensively, that was is it's a good point because two in and and three in out to wing, they're very hard positions to oh, defend in right because as a winger you get you get left posted yep. a lot mm -hmm. if the inside people make a bad decision. Um, in in center position, if you make a bad read, it just brings everything undone. Absolutely, you're the guy. Yeah, pretty much. He could cover up. Any of his errors that he slightly made, he could turn and and recover very mm, well. Like absolutely. He had a really, he he knew when he was he'd gone too far, and he could turn and, and recover pretty quickly. Yep. So that was like really impressive, just to have that oh, anticipation. Absolutely. As I said, like for me, he was top three centers in the game last year. Um, that, I'm, that's a good call, yeah. mate. I'm uh, I'm inspired. <laughs> I'm actually I'm genuinely inspired. You like, get on and uh, yeah, search some courses. I haven't done and shit. <laughs> Close it down. Blokin' Abari is shit compared to this guy. This guy moved from a third world country, goes to the Storm, the hardest squad to get into, goes there, kills it, wins a premiership, and he has a degree in applied physics. Applied physics. I'm a bum, pretty much. No, that's, that's a truly inspiring. That's really inspiring. It's, it's really cool to hear that. Um, okay, so who is going to win the premiership this year? Insert. You have to lock it in stone. Who cares that there's a whole fucking season ahead of you? Lock it in stone. Who's winning the Premier? I'm going to sit with South. I think yeah. um, I, I, I love the way they finished the season last year. I thought they were uh, they were very consistent. The year before, they looked like they were tapering away a fair bit. They mm. they looked tired at times, mm. but I thought last year they got a bit of momentum. They were unlucky towards the end there, but um, they got really good halves, man. I love both oh. Reynolds and Walker. I love them as players. Mm. And then to be able to just slot Benji on the bench as cover – Crazy. I'm obviously a big fan, big yeah. fan of Benji's, and I love that he's still running around. And mm. whether or not he plays a full season, whatever role he plays, to have someone like him in the club is, is great for him. And I just think they've got really good balance um, throughout their squad. Uh, Their outside backs are, are pretty potent. Mm. Um, plenty of try scoring weapons out wide. Yep. Although they brought in Mansour. Mansour was getting a bit of stick from his Penrith teammates last year because he hadn't no scored try. a try for so long. Mate, um, you know what? I don't think you need him to score a try. His, his runs out of, out of yardage, man, are so good. And, and the balance is good now because Latrell, he's not going to give you 300 metres a game, 200 metres a game. So where do you pick those metres up? Yeah. With a guy like Mansour, a guy like, a guy like, a guy like Campbell Graham. Yeah. Um, Campbell Graham, man, what a, what a kid he is. Would have made the New South Wales squad, yeah. in my opinion, if he didn't get injured um, yeah, for the selection. Yeah. And he's a, great, he's a good bloke. He's doing education stuff. I seen him at one of the nights that I went and did a, like a little... I don't know why they got me to speak. That's fucking <laughs> fuck me there. Um, uh, you know Jason Nightingale? Yeah, they did that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I did a little speech there, and um, he was there. It was, you know, what? it was so good to see the turnout there too. Like the amount of from all different walks of life, from all different clubs. Um, yeah, he rabbit was, me he, too. He was only doing his HSC two years ago when yeah. he debuted. Wow, and now he's that's uh, crazy. He's him carrying on his studies anyway, but mate, that is. It's just. A, I think it's just this. Generation coming through now, they've got so many more resources at their disposal to... I mean, we, we had resources, absolutely. There's yeah. no denying that. But I think that the systems are better in place now to really let players take advantage of that. And there's more of an emphasis on doing that. A bit more role modelling as well from guys yeah, that have totally. already done it. Like James Tedesco has got a degree um, and he's the best player in the game. I, you rattle off a whole bunch of guys that have done that because of the NYC system. They had to study mm. um, and, and do work away from, from the game. And... Um, as, as a consequence, there's guys that are role modeling, yeah, doing yeah. stuff away from the game. So it is, totally. you're right, there's a generation of it. We've got to keep it going. But, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm sidetracking back into my old role. No, 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 it's all good. It's all good. So South to win the Premiership. Yeah, that's, that's who I'm back in. Yeah, I think so too. I think that they'll, um, you know, they'll be there or thereabouts. I think that if they can keep that squad injury free, relatively injury free, running into finals, They'll be a hard team. Wayne yeah. Bennett's last year. They've got all the motivation in the world. This and it's also they're in a premiership window right now. Yeah. You know they've made this the prelim three years in a row. This is their window. You know Reynolds. If he, you know, let's say next year and the year after, after that he'll probably maybe retire. I'm not yeah. sure. You know Walker is about 31, so they're in that window. Um, but yeah, so I, I totally agree. I think your opinion is correct. Thank you. <laughs> Not that it fucking matters what my opinion on your opinion <laughs> is. Um, okay, so take us back to a young fella. Obviously, born in New Zealand. You come over here when you're four years old? Yeah, yeah I was born in uh, Invercargill, which is like right down the Southland. Um, mm. As you can tell by my accent, I've been here for a long time. Mm. So I moved over when I was four, like you said. Um, my dad was uh, a rigger and a scaffolder when we were younger, mm. late 80s. I was born in 83. I'm pretty, pretty old now. But yeah. um, there was a lot of work in Australia for, for riggers and scaffolds, like yep. a building going on. So he mm. come over, we followed, uh, and, and that was it. Like I'd, 
I was a um, yeah, young kid, started playing my junior footy in the Parramatta Comp. We lived like around the hills area. Mm. There wasn't many. Um, was it just you, you and your father or did you have your mother there? Mum, yep. uh, my little sister and my older brother. Okay. So yeah, the whole five of us moved over. Um, but yeah, where, where I live, there wasn't much footy around the area. It was in the north sort of comp, but mm. there wasn't a, a team um, close by. And then we ended up going to um, the Winnie Magpies, went with full Magpies. Oh, yeah, okay. Kid. So that was... It wasn't actually that wasn't actually close, but my dad heard it was a pretty good club, so I'll give you uh, the best opportunity, kind of thing. Yeah, and he, he and my mum were involved in a, a rugby league club back in New Zealand, so okay. um, yeah, their their league is through and through, and it was just always going to be the case for me and my brother to play play, play league footy. Yeah, that's um interesting. So they, you know, rugby is big in New yep. Zealand, not league, but they were always leagues. Yeah, they were leagues. Daddy, uh, dad, dad, daddy, daddy, <laughs> daddy, dad. He and my mum it started uh, helped start a, a club. In, in the south and i think they're called the southeast knights mm. i think they were called and um yeah they just he must have played league when he was a kid and yep. just stuck and with loved it. it yeah um okay so at what so you you, you begin playing and and what were you always someone that was a cut above the rest or not really no, i was just, rubbish I was, oh really yeah I, when i like i, I was okay i yeah. guess um i was played in a team that was really we had some really good players we won like the first nine years as a kid mm. we won every year won the no, premiership every year so far out. like it well, it wasn't easy, but like we just had a really good team. Hey, nine it. years in a row sounds fucking easy to me. <laughs> it was, it was a, some really good players. Was Craig Bellamy your coach? Or what? <laughs> fucking hell. No, nah, Warren Reiki. I give Warren Reiki a shout out. He was my first. The Bellamy coach. of the local league. Yeah, he was. He was. <laughs> um, but we, he was a really good coach. Taught mm. us the fundamentals really well. But also, we worked hard. We were respectful. Like, I remember one of the first things we did was we'd walk at the start of every training session, walk mm. past each other and shake each other's hands. No way. So as a kid, just, little things like just that. to walk along the line and yeah. show respect to each other, it was a pretty good lesson for us to learn. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it taught us uh, the, um, the fundamentals really well. And mm. um, yeah, I was probably not, yeah, I wasn't great. I was just like average, average player. And then um, even when I got to like, my mid-teens, I was, I was average. I ended up moving out to the wing. This is no disrespect, disrespect <laughs> to wingers, but... Hey. I was out in the wing just not doing much you know okay. like I, that was that was what i was doing mm. sort of early mid-teens and then yeah. um i went to westfields i don't know why but i moved, i must have played a game in a junior league grand final at fullback and one of the westfields coaches was there and he just said hey i like what i've seen and you, you want to come and and try your luck at westfields mm. which is sports school out in fairfield west and okay um so they like a, a sports school in the sense like they have a pretty good sports program yeah they've got dedicated sports programs okay. like volleyball athletics soccer rugby league cricket okay. so they got a bunch yep. um they also it's a state school so they take locals as well it's a, it's a bit of a combo school like endeavor or okay um any of those other sports schools in sydney um yeah so i went there and i thought if i go here and have a crack maybe i'll get better at footy and it mm. might lead to something else but even there like i had my battles i was afraid to tackle and yeah really um you know it probably wasn't that was probably my biggest challenge was it wasn't the most courageous oh really um but they worked hard with me and yeah. um you know, worked on my techie and that, but also got over that sort of fear. fear of it, and, yeah. um, I think that probably ended up becoming something that I was. I was just going to say, okay, like, just, that's literally just, one of your strongest points is just, just working hard getting through defense, work. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that was probably if I didn't make that change, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have played footy. I would have quit. Wow. Like, sort of mid teens. That's then, crazy. Fuck um, yeah. And and that wouldn't have been the case. But um, yeah, that was probably the launching pad for for making something like your footy. Mm. And so who was your team as a teenager? Was it Tigers? Yeah, well, yeah, my brother and I, when we were kids, he supported the Bulldogs, I supported the Tigers. So, oh, oh, no way. Um, yeah, for me to be able to play for both the clubs that we supported as, mm. as kids. it was. Any memories as kids watching the games or anything? Um, I went to a game at, I've been to a game, sorry, I went to a game as a kid at Leichhardt Oval. Mm. Um, I remember Gary Freeman got sin and mm. being a Kiwi kid, seeing uh, the Kiwi halfback at the time playing for the club that I supported get March for 10. That was pretty funny, but like far out. Was the cool. crowd going? Because that's back in how it would have been like 19, early 90s? It was early 90s. So, yeah, like the, the, Tigers, going wild. Yeah, the, the Tigers are well supported. Like I know, it was a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. So oh, perfect. It, was, it was full and um, yeah, it was pretty funny. And Look. he actually had to go to the, um, to the southern end, which was um, uh, where the, the old change rooms, I guess, were, not yeah. um, in, the, um, in the western stand. So okay. he did the old. Um, yeah, March down and uh, in front of everyone walking yeah. past him. Was there just, just people just giving it to him? In yeah, there? people were, like hey, the wires. The wires up in the fence are still there, but everyone's yeah. leaning over the wires and just blasting uh, him. Um, yeah, there's something about that nostalgic, you know, '90s footy. You know, where like 
I don't know, like the crowds were a bit bigger. Well, they were a lot bigger. Um, well, was, I don't know. If, we, if you went back, you might find that the, the general crowds probably weren't or the average crowds probably weren't as much different to what they are now. Really? But we, like we do this. We romanticise football. Yeah, absolutely. Because Maybe it's because we romanticise the big games. Yeah. So we and, think of the big games. Yeah, yeah, and it's always the games as a kid that you're at where – you may be shoulder to shoulder with your family and, and a mm. few supporters and everything's so big. Mm. And when you get older, you go, man, those crowds are enormous. But so true. There might have been four so or five thousand. So have crowds there. gone up? I don't know. I, oh, can't, okay. I can't quote the quote the numbers, okay. but there, there have been like I've watched old games and gone yeah. and not not big matches, like just old regular yeah, yeah, season yeah. matches that they may be put on, you know, for whatever reason. Mm. You know, the crowd looks pretty average. Really? Semi finals and that, and I go, why is the crowd so shit? I always remember the crowds it's been massive, been huge. But you know what? I I think. I wish, I, and it seems like Vlindy is going that direction. I love the suburban grounds. Yep. Like the, I think that having more smaller stadiums is is the way to go. Like Sun, you know, Suncorp is probably the only one that's a big stadium that works. ANZ, I know they have deals and everything. I know the money they make from it. I know, but in a perfect world, I would small fifteen to twenty thousand stadiums or twenty five thousand stadiums, maybe for the bigger clubs. And just keep it like real local. Yeah. Huh? Look, I think for our game, our game is is really good to watch on on TV, yeah, right? So, so people take that option, and Absolutely. it's so available to mm. watch on TV that you want to make the the in ground experience really good, so that there's a reason for people to go Absolutely. there. And the boutique stadiums work because the atmosphere is better. Everything mm-hmm. feels a lot closer and bigger. Totally. I, I love Bankwest. I think you know, I, I went to the first game there. I was mm. lucky enough to sit on the sideline for for radio on that first game and. Mm. That packed, even though the Tigers got flogged, they got absolutely spanked Humped. by the Eels. But remember Mitch Moses scored the first try. Yeah. Was it a, I think it was an intercept. Or no, yeah, 80-meter try. It was 80 metres. Yep. I think it was off a 20 tap. And Gutho quick, gave it to yeah, him. Yeah, gave it to him. And he just went yep. long way right. And yep. the crowd in that um, southwest corner, which was where I was sitting, yeah. scored right there. Man, I'm getting tingles thinking about it because wow. it was so big. And, um, you know, that that's what – footy is about right Absolutely. just that um that really big atmosphere those big moments at, at grounds where yeah, the old Parramatta stadium was was a pretty cool place as a kid to go mm. and watch footy it's probably the place where I watched the most footy as a kid yeah and you kind of got that sense again when, yeah. when that game was played it's and, about the size I reckon yeah because that's about 20,000 25 uh it's I think oh, top end of 20 so like close to 30 I'd yeah say. so yeah. like let's say it's 28 I yeah. think like for out in Parramatta like that's the perfect size yeah. if they go 50 60 it just you need. I, I feel like you need it to be close to the ground, yeah. like Suncorp. It's, you're right there. The footy's right there. Whereas ANZ's a bit further away. So, um, I think Bankwest is such a smart stadium. I think yeah, that that's it's yeah. a great facility. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a place for the big ones. Obviously, we, we have our big matches. Yeah, and totally. There's a place totally. for those big stadiums. Just but. like we don't have the the luxury of AFL, where like AFL, you need to see what's going on. So it's so good to be at the game because you can see like down the field because the the. The focus is quite a wide focus in AFL, whereas NRL, you only need to really see like pretty much who's got the fucking ball. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, you know, you want to see that contact, and that's why visual is so good on TV, is because you can see the contact. Whereas, don't get me wrong, it is good to see it in real life because you can hear the impact, everything like that. But um, yeah, the suburban grounds are awesome. Bankwest is freaking awesome. I just A and Z, just oh, I know they've got deals in that, but it kills me to watch games in that. Like I'm on TV. Looks so dead. I'll, I'll be really interested to see how it goes at SFS once it's redone. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah, totally. It's going to be a pretty world class facility. Yeah, it's going to have big capacity, mm. not too big that it's overwhelming Absolutely. and that we, it, it feels really empty. But mm. I, I think it's going to be a really good, um, really good place for us to watch footy and big matches will, will go really well there. Yep. Um, yeah. So I can't wait for that one. Mate, that is going to. When is that? Two thousand twenty-three, maybe twenty-three. Matt, that is going to be. And it's right, right in the city, like yeah. pretty much in the city. Um, Okay, so at what point did you start, you know, interest from NRL clubs? Was it a lot or was it a few? What was it like? <laughs> no, I was, um, so Parramatta Junior, I played Harry Matthews at Parramatta mm. um, and then got cut from the SG Ball side after Matthews. So I was no way. 17, um, SG Ball was 18s, trialed out, didn't make it. So I, I didn't get cut, I just didn't make it. Didn't make it, wow. And then okay. um, the, uh, the Tigers, uh, Gary Freeman, mm. funnily enough, was, no was coaching the SG Ball side and I just – been on a like a, it wasn't a rep tour it was just a um pay your money and come along tour yeah, like yeah. to england um it was really good academy tour they called it mm. um and I, i'd just been on a tour he was the coach mm. and uh he rang me up he, he must have known that i was i didn't make Parramatta. he goes why don't you come over to the tigers for a run and then um went over the tigers for a run and basically had to just slug my way through the grades there so that was when i was uh 17 went to the tigers and then made my debut at 20 but that was after playing SG ball SG ball flag flag reserve grade yep 
and then injuries, opportunity. I wasn't in a I wasn't in a full time squad or anything. I trained a couple of sessions with them in the preseason. Mm. I just had a few good games in reserve grade in two thousand and three, and Sheenzy said, "Come train with us." Yeah. Two weeks of training, injuries, and I was in. That was wow. it. So it's, it's crazy to think that a guy you saw get sent off as a kid <laughs> is the coach that yeah, you know, yeah. says, come <laughs> along. You know what I mean? Like, who would have thought that you're sitting there as a kid watching him get sent off? You remember it. That same guy would give you that opportunity to yeah. come play for him, and then you would obviously go on to play um, all those. In a, okay, so so basically you just come through the grade. So did you have a reserve? You would have had a reserve grade contract then when Sheensy said. Yeah, I was on a. Um, it was a New South Wales, yeah, New South Wales rugby league contract, yeah, and yeah. it was, yeah, it was incentivized. So play X amount of reserve grade games, yeah. and you get paid or you get this yeah. amount. Um, I was playing flag, so I think I got, I think I might be got pulled up into into reserve grade just before the season started, mm. and then I ended up staying there. Um, yeah, so I was still on my reserve grade contract, and wow. it was peanuts. I was, I was waiting for ten games of reserve grade to actually get any pay some money. Wow. They covered my medical. That was that was there, yeah, and important. I got a free pair of boots. I think so. Oh, okay. winning, uh, winning, yeah, winning. So, <laughs> so Sheenzy, yeah, called me in, and as soon as I got called in, um, I was I had match payments in my New South Wales yeah, yeah. contract. That if I make NRL, this is my match payments. Yeah, okay, and, wow. Um, yeah, they they started coming in after that, so I was pretty stoked. <laughs> hey, oh, mate, the matches. Is this, it's the first feeling you get of actual money. Yeah. Especially when you're a person like yourself or me where you didn't grow up with any money. So it's like nah. when you get paid that first time, it, you look back on it now and you're like, that's actually not that much money. But because you grew up with no fucking money. Yeah. Um, I, I was working at the time at Video Easy. Oh, Video Easy. I was working at, and most people watching this wouldn't even know what Video Easy is. That's because so crazy. I made the mistake of this a, a few weeks ago when I was out of school. And I was talking about working at Video Easy, and the kids are blankly sitting there going, "That is weird, frick, bro. What's, what's Video Easy?" <laughs> oh man, I feel so old. But I was working there the year I debuted. I was getting paid twelve dollars or eleven dollars an hour oh. to to rent videos. Any out. stories of like late, like the latest ever brought back DVD? Oh, uh, there was a few. I, I remember this this little old lady come back one day, and she and and this is the system that you have at a video shop. Mm. It just accumulates the fees, the yeah. late fees. They just keep building up. Yeah. And then there's a point where the system will send it to a debt collector. Yeah. The debt collector sends a letter out to, to everyone. Oh, hey, you owe us this much money, pay now. Yeah. Or we're coming after you. Yeah. Legal, whatever. It's an empty threat. Mm. As far as I know, it's an empty threat. <laughs> but this poor lady come in with like this, oh, this massive like um, debt. And I've, you remember how much it was? Oh, I can't remember. It, it, it might have been like eight or 900 bucks or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's still big for an old lady. Enough, yeah. you know, like for anyone really. Yeah. And I felt so bad for it. And we could just wipe it. I said, yeah. don't worry about it. We'll just wipe it and we'll get it all yeah, squared yeah, away so you don't have to worry about it. So yeah. that was it. But then if, the, if you got customers in that you knew just were like either blunt or rude and didn't really yeah. give you the respect because you're working behind a counter yeah. and they had late fees, no, you got to pay your late Absolutely fees before you stinging. can hire. Yeah, fucking oath. Man, it is, Video Easy could have, like it was the best business model in history. <laughs> Think <laughs> it about it. It was so good, man. You buy 10 DVDs for... 30 bucks each, whatever the fucking price is. We'll say, we'll say 30 bucks. Yeah. That's what? 300 bucks. Two times three? Yeah, yeah that's right. Good bucks. Bucks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, and then you rent them for a year for five bucks a night. Let's say yeah. they rent out every night, five bucks a night. Like, that's what? Five times seven is fucking 35. Yeah. For a year? You got to do the year? Yeah, I mean, but say five times a week for a year. Well, yeah, five times a week for a year. And then times that by the 10 DVDs that you had. Yeah. Like, that DVD, very scalable, right? Oh yeah. my god, the money, the early, the money, the early video easy people would have been making would have been yeah. crazy. Yeah. Um, well, so you're good, you've got the karma then, but you know what? That's probably why you played in a role because you wiped to debt. Yeah, yeah, wiped to debt. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> not the not the rest of them. Yeah. Was there debt. any anyone that was just absolutely you remember going, mate? This guy is a constant punish. Nah, uh, there was a few people that came in regularly and got. Um, I think it was Wednesday. They'd come in. There was one person I remember coming in on a Wednesday, and it was six weeklies for six dollars. Yeah. But the six weeklies were from the R18 section that, uh-huh. it, that you always get. <laughs> so I remember. I remember him. I remember him coming in every week, and I'd see him shuffle in the store, and I go, "Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. It's a fucking old dude. That how old was he? Was he? Is an older uh, guy, or a younger guy? A forty park, park flight, mid forties. Mid forties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just a yeah. battler doing his best. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's crazy. Okay. So. Before he could get online, yeah. Yeah, they totally ruined the video easy scene. The, yeah. the to- like all, all profit margins went to shit when <laughs> online porn coming. Um, okay, so, so, so he calls you in 
Do you remember some of those first training sessions where you're training with first growers and you're going, oh, what, this is intense? Well, yeah, there's a few guys from, from Reggie's that had, had been called up from the previous mm. year. So I, like, I, I knew them and I knew what that was like. Mm. Um, but just the day, day in, day out, turning up to training mm. was like was new. So, yeah, going into the morning and doing gym, not going to the gym before we trained mm. at 5 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. Like yep. That's the little things around routine that you sort of you start to pick up. Okay, this is what it means to be full-time is that mm. I'm turning up in the morning instead of – squeezing it in after work yeah um yeah so that was probably the first thing i noticed the, the guys yeah everything was done at a high tempo and mm. with more intensity and and you move between drills with more intensity so mm. that was just that professionalism that was a, just a jump up that's Absolutely. why it's first grade yeah yeah um, and it's like every day too not just yeah. some days you train well yeah i remember and then like also having a like there was big guys in reserve grade but Steve Trindle was a guy. I don't know if you remember Steve Trindle. He's a front row. Played at Norse and played at the Tigers, and he yep. was a ma- he was a massive human being. Everything was long on him, and wow. every everything was hard. So mm. doing scrimmage with a guy that's like a seasoned NRL player, yeah, and he's 115, 120 kilos of just like boniness. Yeah, can't tough country lad. A really good fella. Yeah, um, yeah, that was just like, oh. every time like oh my god, it was why? 88, 88 kilos or eighty seven kilos? No way. Just scrimmage with these guys. I'm like, this is like. I've got to harden up really, really yeah, quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so how did the debut come about? Do you remember the conversation? Yeah, no, it was. Um, I, I was training, like I said, for about th- two or three weeks with first grade, and then um, it was against Manly, and I'd gone back to reserve grade on the Thursday or the Friday night mm. to get ready for that game, and then on Friday morning, sorry, Saturday morning, we had a captain's run, and um, I got a call early in the morning from Shanzi saying uh, we need you to come to training mm. um, to cover for Chris Patterson. Mm. Another front rower, um, he had, had an injury hanging over him and then we go to training, not expecting to play because he's a front rower off the bench. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, a, I'm playing centres at 87 kilos in reserve grade. So you were a centre? I was a centre then. Holy um, moly. And he um, he ruled him out in the warm-up and said, you're in. And I've gone, okay. And Robbie Farrell was debuting the same. No he got way. got late for, um, I think it was Robbie Mears or, or Darren Senna. It might have been Darren Senna. Robbie got called in. Mm. Um, so we both debuted together. But yeah, he was a little bit – he got called in, I think, on the Friday. I got called in on the Saturday. And so do you, do you remember anything from the debut? Like, Yeah, I played three minutes. It was oh. the biggest anti-climax of my life. It was the last oh three minutes of the God. game. Um, we were down by eight points. So we it was like out of our grasp really. Mm. And Shane decided to put me on for the last yeah, three, three minutes. And um, – I remember on the way to the game, I was nervous as I yeah. stopped to go to the toilet 10 or 11 times. <laughs> yeah, and, yep, yep. But yeah, sitting on the bench, I was probably got to about the 60th minute and I started getting a bit deflated. I'm like, I've got tickets for my family, my mates had come. So I yeah, had absolutely. 15 people watching and I, and I wasn't going to get on the field. Uh, but when I got on, I made, um, I think I made three tackles, mm. no carries. I tackled Steve Menzies, oh, um, which was like a big highlight for me because I love Steve Menzies as a player. Yeah. To- I told him the story only a few weeks ago, actually, that. I um I tackled him in my in my debut and that was the highlight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I got paid four grand for it. Talk about oh, uh, how good is that? <laughs> four grand matches. Four. It was a debut bonus. So oh, okay. I was going to say the match. Who's payment. giving the four grand matches? <laughs> I wasn't getting that shit. It was a match payment and a and a bonus. So, yeah, how um, good is that? So yeah, three minutes worth of work. I'll never get paid a rate better than that. In no my life, way. So, um, it was pretty. Who knows? You could turn out to be fucking Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> you and Olam start your own fucking space yeah, latch company. On to, latch on to Justin. Olam, give him a call, got. mate. Start a space company. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, so did you stay in the side after that? Yeah, I ended up playing um, the next – I might have I might have gone back to reserve grade for a week and then I got pulled back up and I ended up playing in the centres for like another eight games that year. It was yep. halfway through the season, so mm. played the majority of the, the rest of the year in, in first grade. Did and, you re-sign that year then or the next year? Uh, I think I might have had a clause <laughs> in the contract to upgrade, like okay. to get an upgrade if I played so many games. So I think yep. I, I must have met that. That clause. Um, so I got, yeah, I got a, a deal in, in top squad for for next year. Yeah, it was a might have been a two year deal, but um, mm. yeah, got got myself a, a first grade contract. So video easy was. See you later. See you later. Yeah. Ah, uh, video easy. You know what? You, you know what? I'm pretty sure that was when video easy started to fall. Would have been close to it. Yeah, that was we're still doing. So you know what have been the the DVD ripping was pretty big then as well. So yeah. like. Yeah, DVD. To be honest, I think it's because you left. <laughs> That's what I, I, I'm. Look, I'm just throwing it out there. Correlation doesn't always mean causation. A, yeah. But you left. Video Easy went out of business. Yeah, yeah. You do the math. Olam, do the math. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the next year, did you stay in centre the next year, or did you move into the second row? Uh, played centres and mixture. Like I kind of covered 
covered a lot of different. Like I'd yep. play off the bench, play a bit of second row, maybe. Um, covered some hooker. That was the first time I covered hooker. Like I never yeah. played hooker in my life, but mm. um, <laughs> just whenever we had injuries, I was like covering there. Yeah. Um, but mostly center, I would say in that 04 season. Yeah. And you get selected at hooker for New Zealand that year. Yeah, I, I got selected. I went over. Uh, on a tour at the end of the year in 04. How did that, like the phone call and that, were you shocked by it? Yeah, I was, yeah. They, they um, I got, a, I think I got a letter actually. Maybe the club let me know. No way, a letter. We got a letter for you. Wow. That's <laughs> we'll post it out there and you'll find did. out the news in a couple they of days. They sent it to but, video easy. Fuck <laughs> it <laughs> um, But yeah, it was, it was, the club let me know and then sent me the official letter. You're in the touring squad. Mm. Um, so I went on tour to, Engl- to England for six weeks, seven that's weeks. That's out, like, you know, your yeah. second year in a row, you're coming off the bench a bit and you're playing, starting sometimes. So you're not like, you know, I'm sure in your head you're kind of like, oh, I still haven't cracked that starting spot, so I'm not sure. And then you get the call on the Kiwi side. Yeah, it was. Um, I was. Yeah, I was pretty surprised, pretty shocked, and mm. um, yeah, at the same time, like really stoked and, and proud. As much as I'd, I'd been in Australia as a kid and grew up here and, and mm. was raised here, uh, my dad had drilled it into me to, to follow the Kiwis. You're so every Kiwi. Test match we, we watched, I was following the Kiwis. And, Absolutely. Um, they'd get belted a lot of Test matches, but I'd still <laughs> stick with the Kiwis through and through. And, <laughs> yep. Um, you know, they had some, some really good players that, that I love watching. So, um, yeah, I was pretty pretty sh- shocked to get to get called up. and mm. um, But, yeah, really excited to spend, you know, we spent a week in New Zealand and then six weeks in England. Oh, wow. Was, was that tour like? Any memories from the tour? Yeah, it was it? Look, we didn't, we probably didn't get the, the best results. Mm. Um, I don't think we um, might have won one match. I can't remember. I didn't, I only played one, sorry, I played two matches. I played against France in a, like an almost an exhibition international. And mm. then I played... Um, the last test against England. Um, mm. But yeah, we didn't win the series. Uh, Daniel Anderson was a coach, pretty good coach, good guy. I actually bumped into him the other day. He's, um, he's a really, really good guy that I yep. enjoyed spending time with. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't the most successful tour. I think we were a bit distracted by being in England and um, yeah. having a good time. It wasn't. Yeah, it was in England. Um, yeah, it wasn't probably the, the ideal um, ideal series for us. But I got yep. to play alongside blokes like Ruben Wiki, mm. um, Nathan Kalis, uh it was Sonny Bill's first tour with the Kiwis. Oh, Roy no Satazi, um, Paul Rahi was playing. Oh, man, it was like a, yeah. a, re- a really good experience for me yep. as a kid. Um, what did you did you feel you kind of like learnt from that tour when you saw those older guys? You know, sometimes when you see the elite of the elite, you're like, okay, that this is what I need to do. Um, probably uh, Ruben Wiki, right? So he would partner up with me a lot when we're doing scrimmage work. And I, I said before, like, I had to work constantly on just overcoming that fear of contact and being better. Mm. In, in if there's one man that can help you with contact, it's that he'd, maniac, Ruben he'd, Wookie. He'd pick up a pad and go, let's do some tackles together. And he'd just go at me hard. And yeah, I just okay. remember hitting him and going, man, I'm tackling a cement wall here. Like, this guy is just, yeah. he's hard, right? Absolutely. You spent time with him. Like, he's, um, mate, he's, hey. he's a hard dude. So, um, you know, to probably learn from him about what it takes to be a first grader is to, is to get get over that fear of, of contact or whatever mm. it was for me that I needed at the time. And um, Nathan Kalis, super professional, like he did everything he had to do to, mm. to get himself in in the right shape. So I learned from him. Um, Nigel Vungano was on that tour as well. And, and wow. Nigel, what a legend of a bloke he is. Like he I, just a lot of people that I've spoken to about Vungano is like he's so in, he's helped develop a lot of young people just yeah. by speaking to him. Yeah, and he was. The role that I was previously doing at the NRL, he was in that role okay. um, for I think eight years before moving across New Zealand Rugby League and mm. a bit of a pioneer in, in that space in terms of just trying to connect with players and make sure that they are well supported off mm. the field. He was the same on tour. He was my roomie actually in, in, in Auckland. And um, if you want to have a long session like on the drink. <laughs> oh, really? Loves a drink? <laughs> Nigel. Well, he, I wouldn't say loves a drink. He's just very good at drinking. Oh, so, okay, okay. So um, when he when he performs, he performs. Yeah. But it could yeah. be sparingly. Yeah, so I learned how to keep up, I suppose, from <laughs> wow. Nigel early days, but also yeah. good life life coach guy. Yeah. He's really good to Ooh, learn I had from. someone on recently, and he, uh, I think it was I think it was Benny Roberts. Yep. Similar situation. I think, I don't know if he roomed with Vangana, but he spoke to him a lot about the Samoan culture. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure. I he's he's very proud, yeah. very proud of his, his heritage. heritage yeah. And, so and I think it might have been him, but apologies if I got that wrong. Um, okay. So 2005 rolls around and this is the year. This is the year. <laughs> yep. So did you, could you feel it at the start of the year or not really? Um, like every other team starting this year, you finish a preseason feeling the fittest you've ever felt. Yeah. Your structures are in place. You feel really good about what's going to happen, and yep. it would have been no different for us that year. But um, I think early on, we, we won a few games early on, but then we sort of started going through like a bit of an up and down phase. But we were doing things off the field that 
we probably hadn't done before. We had a, a whiteboard up and as any, any Tigers player from that year will remember the whiteboard. And the whiteboard had all their names and you'd go up there and you'd write anything extra that you'd done for the, for the week on the whiteboard. Oh, and okay. It wasn't so much just to show off. It was just to hold each other accountable. And then if you've seen someone else was doing something, you wanted to, to do it as well because Absolutely. you didn't want to be the one blank space on the board that did totally. nothing to better yourself that week. Totally. Um, so that became, I think, probably the backbone of that year was the fact that we were all doing something extra to improve ourselves and we all could see what we're doing and we're all really accountable to that. Mm. Um, and I think it would just become something, we went on a run, I think, of eight games in a row. Mm. It would have been probably round, I'm going to say round 12 or so, um, maybe a bit later. We had a win and then we had another win and then we just kept going and we won eight in a row. And probably five games into that run there was a real sense of like hey guys we're doing something really good here yeah the style that we're playing other teams aren't able to keep up with us absolutely you know, we're a chance of doing some damage here mm. i remember ben galea set us a, a lofty target at the start of the season he he said uh we were setting our goals as a team and because mm. we hadn't been in the eight for ages or we hadn't been in the eight i don't think um he said let's oh well, there was a group that said let's set our target as the eight mm. and everyone's yeah let's set the eight and then benny goes wow. no nah, that why don't we set it as a top four Wow, he said, "Let's why, why be satisfied with the eight? Absolutely. So that was that was what he said, and we ended up making the top four. Yep. Um, so that was um, that part of the goal ticked. Um, mm. And like I said, the sea accountability was really high in that group. And you moved into lock this year too, correct? I played um, off the bench a lot. I played covered centers, covered. I don't think I covered back row, but I was playing centers, hooker, um, a little bit of lock. Mm. It wasn't until the finals that I played lock. Oh, like, really? As a starter? Wow. Um, okay." So we're about to start the final series and um, it was against North Queensland, that first one, and Sheens had come up to me before he picked the team and said, I'm going to play a lock this week. Hadn't started there all year. I go, oh, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> Liam Fulton was our regular lock yeah. pretty much up until that point. Um, and he said, I just want to try something different for the first 20, 30 minutes of the game. Mm. I'll bring Liam back on as, as a lock after that, but I want you just to get in dummy half. Whenever Robbie runs, you run or okay. vice versa. He wow. goes, I want you to just to... He goes, because I was okay at running at a dummy half. Mm. So he goes, I just want you to be really fast and explosive at a dummy half, mm. get us on the front foot uh, and use a double up and that'll get our sets moving. And that's what we did the whole final series. We just go, Every man, time Robbie, run, boom, boom. double dummy half. And that was yeah. it. At first, momentum. That, yeah. That first game against the Cowboys in the finals, we beat them like 50 to 12 or something like that. Wow. And our ruck speed was so high. Mm. Um, I think Hodge, uh, Brett Hodgson set a point scoring record for a finals match in that game. Scored no a couple way. of tries and kicked a bunch of goals. So Wow. Yeah, that was kind of the... And so the then you play the Dragons in the prelim? Yep. Score two tries. <laughs> yeah. Game of the career. Yeah, sure. that, that was a long time ago. Uh, I lived off that. I probably lived off that, lived off that for a bit too long. But, uh, <laughs> we'll go yeah, through it. It was... Uh, mate, it was we, I think the, the Swans were playing in the grand final that night. It was a Saturday night. Mm. They used to have Saturday night grand finals. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong. Saturday I'm afternoon. Sure. It was Saturday afternoon grand finals. Um, they still do have Saturday grand yep. finals, don't they? Um, but they were in the grand final and we were in the sheds and they'd just won the grand final and um, we were watching it on one of the TVs in the sheds. No way. Um, so, you know, back in your mind thinking, oh, it's a red and white night. Like the red and whites got up. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, absolutely. And then during the week, there was a bit of press around the fact that the, uh, the Dragons had snapped up majority of the tickets in the stadium as well. So it was going to be a really small Tigers contingent. But yeah. um, we are all pretty relaxed still and um, – getting ready for the game and then we went out to warm up and the whole place lifted when we come out mm. like whatever tigers fans were there they just swamped the dragons fans and, wow um yeah man it was it was probably the best atmosphere that i've ever gone out to for a warm-up mm. and then for the majority of the game it was it was amazing like the, it was such a buzz mm. it, it felt like the grand final just for that that crowd wow. that was that was there the, the dragons fans were silent for the whole game but wow 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 so you score the two tries. Which one do you like best? What, what, what do you prefer? Well, the second one, I, I didn't really have to do anything. Like it was, I was, I'd moved out to the wing or to centers because Paddy had, Paddy Richards had come off injured, yep. so I was filling in left left center or something, and I just caught the ball on the end of a yeah of a back line move, couple passes, right? Uh, the first one was dummy half. So I think Benny Galea had had a run, and Benny Galea will take credit for that try because <laughs> it was a super quick play of the ball. Okay. Um, and I just jumped in dummy half. I pushed Robbie out of the way. Robbie was going in to pick it up and pass. I said, give us a run, Robbie. And mm. he just jumped out of the right way yep. and gave me a run. And I picked it up, went around to the right. The markers weren't set. Um, I think uh, Luke Bailey might have been at marker or Justin Paul was at eight. I can't remember mm. who was in the middle of the – I shouldn't bring out the names and 
make that my highlight reel. But, uh, <laughs> but I just got through the middle of the ruck uh, and then scored next to the post. I wasn't even sure if I got it down. but the, Really? Yeah, but that was definitely probably the highlight try of my life. Wow, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Matt, what an important try. It gets you yeah. into the grand final as well, like yeah, two tries as well. Um, the next, the, the week of the finals though, you get in the finals and like what's it, what's it like leading to that finals? Because you would have been only maybe 22 now? It's 22, yeah. yeah so, so GF sure. was um, it was a busy week. Mm. It was probably, I probably was too young to take it in. Yeah. Um, in a, in a, not, not, in a, not that it was negative, but like in a real positive way. Like I was just probably stressed by it too much. There's yeah. so much going on. Because you just want to focus on the game. I just want to focus on the game. Yeah, and I just played like a really big game, yeah. so I was teetering on confidence and like shit. I got to back that up in the grand final now, mm. and um, with everything else going on, it become like a pretty full on week. But yeah, well. still, one that like, the the buzz around our joint was was great. We had a, an open training session, I think the Thursday, um, so the fans all turned up. Tim Brasher came to one of our training sessions. He hadn't oh, really? been around the club for a while. I think he was at the time living overseas. He'd flown back just to be oh, a part yeah, of the week. So I loved Tim Brasher as a kid. Mm. So watching, uh, seeing him come to training was was cool, but um, yeah, just a blur of a week into mm. a blur of a game. Yeah, I can I, I, I can only imagine like it's just so much going on. Yeah. Like it's so and it's like so mammoth of a task. Like you, the it's almost like you just you so easy to get distracted in the gravity of the whole situation. But at the end of the day, it's a game of footy. You know, yeah. like that's really what it is. Yeah, um, yeah. So the grand final happens, and and you obviously you guys do what you do. Benji does. He's incredible. Like. <laughs> So Benji got moved to fullback, hey, in in defence. Now he's playing. He was playing on the wing in defence, but I think he, um, him and Hodjo had kind of just switched only on that play. Yeah. Oh, I think. Oh, however they were positioned, it wasn't normal where he ended up. But he was defending. Yeah. Um, late tackle count on the wing, and yep. he dropped back for the kicks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was he was back there. Yeah. Um, as one of the receivers. Were you on the field at the time on the bench? No, I'd just come off onto the bench. Okay, so you would have got the best view of it. Then, yeah, just so out. I, I'd, just seen, I'd seen on social media a couple of months ago, there was a, a clip playing that had side-by-side -side screens. It was a cut of the bench, of mm. us on the bench, mm. and the play as it happened. Yeah. And, um, man, it's pretty it's pretty cool footage. It's me, Scando, um, Bryce Gibbs, and Mark O'Neill were on the bench watching, and we just thought... Yeah. We could, oh, actually, I was pretty buggered. I, was, I, think <laughs> I, was, I think I was catching my breath, but... yeah. Um, yeah, what a moment, for Benji, man. I mean, it's in folklore forever. Yeah, like yeah. to do the, the guts to do what he did, incredible. Um, what do you remember from the game personally, like on the field, you know, the, the grimy kind of stuff where you remember? Um, I remember, I, don't, I wasn't that happy with my game. Mm. I, only watched, I only watched the game back once. Oh, I really? Um, probably because in my memory, it was better than what I might like when I watch it back. I think okay. that's what I always went with. Um, but I, I played okay, but didn't really... I didn't meet my expectations from the week, week before, before yeah. so <laughs> yeah. um, I wasn't like all too wrapped with my game. But it was um, it's probably in the balance for for a while, and then we just kicked. Mm. But we always like Scott Prince got Clive Churchill that game, and mm. um, there was a couple of guys that had really really big games. But Princey, watching it when I watched it back, Princey really controlled things really well. Mm. Like it seemed like we always had control of the game because Princey was calm and measured and mm. just did what he needed to do to get us to get us where we needed to get to. Yep. Um, but yeah, I don't really, the, the game was a bit of a blur and, and um, I just remember when Todd Payton uh, scored the last try, we all just piled in. I was on the field. So I'd, I'd moved, I'd actually moved to wing. No way. Um, when I come back on the field because Paddy Richards' ankle gave way like he'd. Because he was injured the week before. Yeah, he was yep. injured. He got a bunch of needles to get him ready for the game. Him actually being available for the game was probably our biggest kick the day before in captain's Oh, run. really? So he, so you guys, because he was so important to you guys, as you saw with the try. Yeah, yeah. So like, he was pretty much out. He was he was borderline out. Mm. And then he did a, a warm-up on captain's run. Mm. Um, I think he may have got a needle to do to, to try and do the fitness test mm. and then didn't train with us. Like So wow. just did a fitness test to yeah, see if yeah. he could ha hack it. Um, but anyway, yeah, he was off the field. I went to wing and I just remember running down after Toddy scored, piling on, and I was out of breath for five or ten minutes because the game was over. Yeah, yeah. And I just I couldn't catch my breath. I was so Mate, excited. It's crazy to think like how different history would be if Paddy Richie doesn't play. Because yeah. <laughs> that fan is an underrated part of that incredible try. The Forgotten Fan. Have you watched yeah. the video of the Forgotten Fan? No, so I haven't. I haven't. Jump, jump on and, um, and Google the Forgotten Fan, Paddy Mate, Richards. And, it's one of the best fans ever. Yeah, he... he Got his hand right in Rod Jensen's face. And Rod Jensen, only the week before, had made a huge cover tackle against Parramatta yeah. to like stop them scoring a try. Maybe would have been critical in that game. Mm. But he, he'd just done that, like come across in cover, come yeah. up with a really good tackle. But he just wore the, the 
Pat nah, it was such a hit. big fan yeah. too. Like, I, yeah, inc- like such a big play. Yeah. In like, if a smaller winger is there, they don't have the strength to fend the way he fended. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he would have been so it would have been his good hand, but I'm sure I'm assuming he's right-handed, so he would have been carrying the ball in his bad. Yeah, but he's playing. He's playing left. I can't remember if he's a left carry um, yep. or not. Um, maybe he just played right, like left side, yeah. right, right carry, whatever. But he um, impressive. Yeah, like left hand carry, big wushka. Bruh, so good. Okay, yeah. so the celebrations. What do you remember from the celebrations? Uh, it was long. Yeah. Um, we yeah, so immediately after the game, we did the the trek to. Um, West Ashfield, West West League Club at Ashfield. Yep. Seen all our fans there. Um, and then went back to Balmain Leagues Club for the night. Um, it was – Balmain Leagues was was unreal. Like the street, Victoria Road was blocked off mm. from one set of traffic lights to the other. We went up on the balcony at the front of the Leagues Club and just like, you know – Doing crazy. Done, done yeah. the old uh, Formula One celebration yep. with the champagne bottles and stuff. And yep. um, then we went up st- upstairs to the Bayview Room at the old, old Leagues Club and we, we were there for – the whole night really yeah yeah i remember going through the auditorium it would have been about uh or well, seven in the morning we had a, we had planned on monday to go out to Campbelltown and see our fans there on a bus so it was going to be a, a pretty tough slog after a big night oh absolutely um but i went into the um auditorium which was just down from where we, the room we were in and i there was they were setting up for a function mm. i grabbed a tablecloth off one of the tables and i just rolled up in the corner <laughs> oh no <laughs> and i just i need to get some sleep and then i remember benji came in and he, he's come and give me a, a slipper. He said, hey, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. I said, man, I need to sleep. I and he goes, I'll move over. <laughs> so <laughs> he jumped out. We just had a quick little So kip. when he grabbed a sheet as well and-, and Yeah, we of, just had a kip. Fuck it yeah. um, And so recharged. you had a kip and then just what? Woke up and then did the function? Yeah, we, were, mate, we, were, we had to go on the bus out to Campbelltown Stadium. Um, if, you, if you look back at footage or photos from that day, I think Hodjo might be missing. Okay. From Campbelltown Stadium because he couldn't make it out of the change room. He was that rotten. Like, oh, really? So just, bad, yeah. just just drunk too much, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> little Hodge. <laughs> how good is that? I mean, he's little. The body can't handle it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, how good is that? Yeah, so you, you and Benji slept on the floor of a uh, a um a function, function room, room. Yeah, yeah, just to get some Z's just before you head out. Recharge. Yeah. And how long do you reckon you get? Forty five an hour? I uh, probably of proper sleep. Maybe it might have been 15, 20 minutes of proper All sleep. Right. But, and you both lying there with a. The cover of a table on you is like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, because the boys drinking in your room. No, well, the room was like a big, another big fun- function. Okay. Everyone was just, just still in there. Just oh, like okay. Still, so still it wasn't home. a hotel. Sorry, my bad. No, this was this was back at Balmain Leagues Club. Oh, that was okay. where we stayed the whole night. Yeah, yeah, yeah sweet. So um, there was. It's not like you just go up to your room. Otherwise, you would have. So you were just like, man, I need a kip. Yeah. Well, kip. I don't on think the we bus. planned that far ahead. Like, where were we going to go to sleep after the Leagues Club? Uh, yeah, we just like, we'll just stay at the Leagues Club. Wow. 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 Um, who who was MVP? Who just seemed to just charge oh. and kick on and kick on? Benji's always Benji's always been the MVP because he um, he dictates terms a lot when we drink. Like he, oh, okay. he's he's the man with the he's the orchestra. He's the man with the drinking games, okay. and he knows the drinking games better than anyone else. So mm. he'll always find a way. Like he can he can put them away, um, Benji. But also um, he knows how to just pick and choose what's going on here when he needs to just yeah. take a step back for a second. So he would have been he probably would have been MVP yeah, for that whole um, post. Really? Grand final week. Wow. Young Benji. Uh, yeah, young Benji. Um, Gallivanting around town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it was an incredible, incredible um, season by you guys. You just, you changed the game. Like, you know, we were speaking about it earlier, but that's, you guys were, the, the play the ball was so quick that the rest will come in pretty much the next year. Um, did you, do you remember any kind of like me, because the next year you guys tried to play similar footy yep. and it was really hard for you guys to do that because people were holding you down and everything like that. Do you remember having discussions internally about like how to combat that or? Yeah, I think we sort of, we, we persisted a bit because we knew, we knew that it was working the year mm. before. Obviously the game changed, so you have to adapt a bit, but a lot of our points would come from our shift plays. Like talk about guys like Billy Slater or Ben Barber in 2012, like fullbacks that really had good presence out the back of those sweet plays, mm. pick the right passes. Brett, Brett was doing that. Hodjo was doing that in 2005. That's why he was so successful. He was a really good ball playing um, fullback. And yep. he'd, he'd link yeah. in. But to be able to execute those plays well, you need, you need time, right? Totally. And when the rucks slow down and the defense, the edge defenders are getting up quicker, that time's cut down. And Absolutely. So a lot of our potency and attack was probably you know snuffed out a little bit by those um, those changes in the ruck and it took us a little while probably too long to catch on to that or to, to adjust Sheenzy was a really good coach he was a, a really good innovator um, and, and he, he came up with ways to, to try and get around it but it was where a lot of our points came from and our defence um, probably in 2006 wasn't strong enough to, to hide the 
the points we weren't getting in yeah, the tack, okay. I guess. I guess yeah. that's what let us down. It's hard for me to think back. Was it? Do you remember? Like, far. Did you discuss the fact that the wrestle had been like you know? Because we, oh, we discussed wrestle. Like yeah. we, we talked about how you know Melbourne were wrestling. It was definitely a conversation that we had. Like these guys are fucking grappling us and you know choking us and that. Like that's what we were talking about when we were playing in, around that era of like six, seven, eight. Yeah, I, I guess um, it's hard for you to remember in like two thousand and six. Mm. Probably it just became the thing that everyone knew that Melbourne wrestled. And I think that wore off pretty quickly because in all honesty, every club started doing it oh, totally. anyway. Absolutely. Um, so it was... I think it was 2000 and... The first time I remember a wrestling coach was probably like maybe 2008, 9, 10 maybe where we got in... Yeah. We had to get in... Our, we got in our own wrestling coach kind of thing. Yeah, and we, we started doing the same thing. Mm. We Look, we may have been doing it previous to that with some specialised coaches just mm. giving us some techniques, but it wasn't to that extent. Mm. Um, so yeah, look, it's hard for me to remember 06, any of our like, conversations yeah, just yeah. about that, but um, it definitely would have would have been on the radar. Like we, we knew that- It was on we our doing, fucking radar, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, Wayne Bennett it, literally it, said- say, it, Over that period of time, it was mm. Melbourne are wrestling and mm. then everyone was wrestling, but Melbourne were the best at it. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, they, they still are. Yeah. Um, I mean, for us, Wayne literally said, if you get choked and you crank neck cranked, get up and throw them, I'll back you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This was in 2008 semi. So it was absolutely an issue for us where we're like, man, they keep choking us. And I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying like, you know, it, like that was just a way to stop the speed of the play the ball. Yeah. And, and that was a byproduct of it. And, you know, everyone does it now. Yeah. It, it, I mean, obviously it's changing now, but since 2000 and probably, I reckon, nine onwards or eight onwards, every single club trained just like yeah. the Melbourne Storm pretty much because it worked. And we've had Romanian uh, wrestlers come in and, and coaches. We've had uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. guys come in and, and coaches around wrestle techniques. Like every got club do has done the same to try yeah. and you know, come up with those techniques so you control the ruck speed. It's, that's, and, and you're right, look, Melbourne were doing what they could within the rules to win games, yep. which is what every single coach every and every single it. club does. Um, it just took everyone else a little longer to catch on. Yep. The rules have adapted to, to remove some of the things that weren't mm. in the best interest of what you're watching and also yeah. player welfare. So, mm. you know, that's the game evolving from a rules point of view. Um, and hopefully the other rule changes, like you say, that have come in have made the ruck quicker and sort of brought it back to that, that fast, yeah, attractive totally. style of footy. At the end of the day, we're trying to win. Yeah. You're going to do anything you can. If you, don't, if, you, if you support a club and you don't want them doing anything they can within the rules to win, then that's like, I'm pretty sure everyone wants the club to win. Some, some teams, and you would have been, I'll say some teams, all teams would be happy to concede penalties, right, at different parts of the field or at different times if they're under the pump. Yep. Give away a penalty because it buys you time. Absolutely. You're cheating to buy yourself time. You're, yep. breaking, you're breaking the rules. The, cheating, the you're, sportsmanship you're, nonsense you're or whatever. Breaking the on-field rules to mm. do that. So, yeah, it's rule, rules will be pushed forever and a day by coaches. Yep, absolutely. Coaches sit on committees and whatnot that come up with new rules and then they'll figure out a way to, to beat those rules. Absolutely. Anyway. It's yeah. always going to be like that. Like even little things where like, you know, the one-on-one raking, you know, ways to like grip them and just release before, um, so it's a one-on-one rake. Yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. pushing the rules a bit. Like it should just be a one-on-one rake, um, you know, so, or, or a player that rakes when there's two in the tackle, that's great. Like, so there's so many um, clubs are always going to do it. Yeah, in yeah. any competitive sport, you're going to find ways to bend the rules and get an advantage over your opponent because yeah. it's so hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it just, it's such a, an intriguing time in rugby league to think that like, you know, the Tigers fast play the balls, then the knock-on effect to the wrestle. And then now we're in the knock-on effect of the new era of like, we're trying to get rid of the wrestle. So it's yeah. interesting to see where the game will go. As I said, I think I said to you before the podcast, could you imagine that 2005 Tigers side in today's game, how yeah. good it would be? Yeah. Fuck. I think they'd do it well. Yeah. You know, the one thing I've noticed like, sort of last year with new rules, probably over the last few years, but last year in particular was the mm. unstructured play has gotten a lot the ad lib footy sort of come yeah. come back a lot, which is really totally. fun. Like it's fun to watch ad lib footy, and um, it there was probably a period as well in amongst all that where it was where footy was really structured. Like, sh- yeah, hundred you know, percent. Points on field, and every club will still do points on field set plays mm. and and go through structured sets. But there's a bit more like fluidity around. Like we can go out of that if we want. If Absolutely. there's an opportunity, if momentum starts swinging, let's yeah. just go 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 kind of thing. And the skill sets there from from players mm. in the game to be able to do that. So. I, I, like, I like, definitely love parts of the game that we're watching now. Oh, totally. I, I think the game last year was so such an exciting product. Um, okay, so I think so. The next year, you play hooker again for the what, the Kiwis. Yeah, I played hooker. I was playing hooker for them because I think at the time there probably wasn't Isaac Luke hadn't come through yet. Okay. And, um, probably didn't have a regular 
um, out and out hooker mm. amongst the Kiwi ranks. Yep. Louis Anderson was playing hooker when I was when I first started, yep. and I sort of shared that role with him for a period. And okay. Louis was a six foot two back rower playing no way. playing hooker, you know, or six foot one. Like he's a big guy. So Louis, um, that wasn't Louis Anderson from the Broncos, was it? No, you're thinking of um, Fraser. So, oh, oh, okay. well, Vinny might have been up at the Broncos. He was a so big, big three, boy. three brothers, Vinny, Fraser, oh, they're brothers. and Louis. Okay. Right? Okay. Yep. Um, and they went off overseas. Louis had a, a big career over in the UK. Okay. Um, Vinny likewise, and, and Fraser had a rugby a rugby career. Oh, really? Yeah, but he was an um, incredibly gifted athlete. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. He's a big square guy Mate, with big shoulders. Big, on massive guy. And could he, I think he got like the third fastest time in our 40 or whatever. Yeah, it was yeah, crazy. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, you, you continue. I mean, you ended up playing what fifteen caps, fifteen test matches. Yeah, I got, uh, sorry. Yeah, fifteen caps, and I was majority of the time a hooker. A hooker. <laughs> That's crazy. And I wasn't. Man. I wasn't a hooker. I wasn't trying to be a hooker. Um, I'd played a little bit at clubland just to cover, as I, I said earlier. I covered there because we had injuries and mm. in the middle of games. Um, and then, yeah, because of the, the shortage in the in the Kiwis, I, I, I got an opportunity to play play hooker there and. Yeah. I just found myself playing there, but I'm passing the ball to Stacey Jones, who's a Crazy. You know, one of the best ever Kiwi players, if not the best ever. Yep, yep. Um, and I'm shitting myself about getting the service in his yep. cat zone because he's not tall, right? So the cat zone, yeah. <laughs> it's different, a little bit smaller. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I just look. My service was never the best. I constantly worked on it. Like mm. I, and I'll tell any young kid that is playing a hooker, always work on your service. And I continually worked on it. I probably wasn't the best at it, but. Mm. Um, I, I did enjoy that it gave me an opportunity to play for the Kiwis. And so 2010, what was the the impetus for going to the Doggies? Uh, going to the Doggies was um, I, f- I felt a bit stale at the at the Tigers. Like I felt like my own game was stale. Like I wasn't yep. um, pushing myself and I've been there for a while. I was, um, you know, pretty much a part of the furniture there. I'd been there for, for that long. And um, I, I had um, talks, like positive talks to stay at the Tigers mm. and then – it was really a last minute thing. The dogs came up. Um, my manager called me and said, hey, the dogs are interested to sit down with you if you're keen to mm. maybe look at, at going elsewhere. Um, so I, yeah, I took the meeting and within a day, I decided to go there. And no way. It, it, I, I sat down with a couple of close people to me that, I, that I'd go to for advice. Mm. And um, the advice was, if you're not feeling um, like you're, you're getting what you want out of your footy as a, at the Tigers, then why not stretch yourself and try a new environment? So that was basically the, the whole reason. And I sat down at the time, Kevin Moore was a coach and Todd Greenberg was a CEO and I'd sat down with both of them and mm. they showed a, a fair, fairly decent willingness to get me across to the club and yep. um, I had a lot of respect for the guys that were already in their, you know, in their team. So uh, it was, yeah, just just happened that way. So, to the, sorry, I forgot to mention, 2008, were you upset the, the Aussies, World Cup? Yeah, well, I didn't like so I was in the World Cup, yeah, in, in the in the squad, but I didn't play in the final, so okay. that was a bit bittersweet. Wow, no, it was it was more sweet. We won the World Cup. Yeah, yeah, I'm not kidding, but um, yeah, it was a massive upset. And you, you mentioned you've mentioned Wayne a couple of times, but um, Mooks was our coach, Steve Kearney was our coach, Wayne was his assistant, mm. and man, Wayne Wayne had this has this good way about him where he's so relatable at at the bloke level, mm. but he's obviously very very good at strategy and team management and innovating in, in rugby league while keeping it as simple as as, Real simple. as you need it as yeah. a footy player, right? Um, yeah, so that that final, the um, the upset came because he said, kick it dead. And this is, no again, coaches, coaches doing what they can to disrupt rules or push rules as far as Absolutely. they can. Absolutely. Kick it dead and change the, the rate that the, the kangaroos want to play at because they don't want to um, – come back and face a set defensive line coming out of their 20. They want to bill you to run. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially, you know, the Kiwis, you traditionally, like for years is you will hit and yeah. hit hard yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. if yeah. you're set, you know? Yeah. So that was basically it. Upset their rhythm mm. by kicking dead. No way. Wherever, like if it's a long kick. Just kick it dead. Feeney, Nathan Feen was, I think, playing half at the time. Um, yeah, just kick it dead. So... Um, that's what that's what we did, and and then yeah, a couple of blunders by the uncharacteristic blunders, I think, because mm. they were out of rhythm. Yeah, the absolutely. And um, the frustration, yeah. and like you just want to get into that, you know, that grind kind of thing. Yeah, some big, really big, really big tournament from um, one one guy that I was like so happy for and impressed with was Bronson Harrison. Mm. He'd um, gone down to Canberra from the Tigers, um, established himself at Canberra. Wasn't in the f- initial touring squad. Mm. Played for the New Zealand Maldives at. at um, um, in a exhibition match mm. and then played really well, got picked up into the squad and ended up 
you know, playing in a World Cup final and killing wow. it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So do you so you, do you remember like the siren goes and you just win the World Cup and this was a huge, huge upset. You know, well, what's what's the conversation like with the boys in that? Yeah, look, it was just and, and you've spent time in New Zealand and and, and a part of that culture mm. and there's a lot of humility amongst mm. amongst the team. Um and, and winning that was was pretty special, like upsetting Big Brother, as mm. what that's what Wayne Wayne sort of put it again, step outside of your big brother's shadow. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he it, was kind of saying to you guys, look, you no longer need to be sitting here going, oh, they're this, that, that, we can do this. Yeah, yeah, you don't don't sit behind him and, mm. and be happy just to be close enough mm. uh, sort of thing. That's he, he brought that up to us earlier in the year. And um, yeah, it was just, it was just a, 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 lot of, um, a lot of pride from, from the team on, mm. on what we achieved as, as a group. Um, and just, uh, yeah, to be able to upset the Kangaroos who had been, yeah. you know, so doing dominant. so well for so long against and us. And you look at that squad, like pff, such an incredible squad, the, the Australian squad. Yeah, yeah. So um, amazing, um, another amazing moment, yeah. And so the, okay, so we fast forward to the Doggies. So you, so you rock up to the Doggies 2000 and was it 10? 10, yep. 2010, and what's that, you know, first year like for you at a new club? Um, it was probably not the, it wasn't the most successful year for me personally. I had a number of injuries. I think I only played six or seven games that year and really struggled to, to get myself in good shape. Mm. Um, so it was a bit deflating to be at a new club trying to establish myself and yeah. prove myself and not performing the way I wanted to and um, yeah so it was it was a tough year but also I learned a lot in the first day I walked in there they, they work really hard and mm. that it's always been known about the Bulldogs about the way that they train and mm. kind of the intent that's been like the legacy that's been left at the club from guys like Billy Johnston and, and um, you know guys before him as well folks who when he was um, coaching yep. slash like a conditioner there it was always about ripping in and training hard. So that's probably the biggest thing I learned my first year was if you're going to be here, you have to learn to train hard mm. and back it up, and back it up and keep going. And um, that was like a really enjoyable um, part of my first year there, uh, first year there aside from yeah, being injured. So, you, you know, you're injured quite a bit. You feel like you're a bit stale at the Tigers. Were you struggling at all for maybe, you know, considering giving it away or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, at the end of that year, um, it was pretty. It was a pretty crap time. It was a pretty shitty time. Like I was yep. not doing what I wanted to do um, by playing first grade, and I just left for a new opportunity. The Tigers had a really successful year too in 2010. They went really close, so I was happy for them. But at the same time, I was like, did I make the right decision in leaving the club? Mm. Because this is all sort of unfolded. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was tough. I, I nearly. I had another um, year, 2011. I played more footy, but then I got injured. I re-injured. Um, what I had in 2010 yeah. and I had to have surgery um, and I, I almost quit then. It was the end of 2011 when I went, really? oh, this is too much. I'm, I'm like, I'm falling to bits every time I get going. And um, yeah, I was definitely considering hanging it up. Terry Lamb actually pulled me aside because he heard me. No I must've mentioned it to someone. Mm. And um, he actually grabbed me um, just in passing. It might've been at Belmore or somewhere, but he just he just had a quick, said a quick word to me like, I. Oh, I heard that you're thinking about tossing it in or something mm. like that. And um, I was, you know, well, been, been trying to be brave and that. I said, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as you do. And, he, and then he goes, oh, he follows it up with like, yeah, mate. He goes, not the right time. He's got plenty of good footage in front of you. And just him saying that was mm. enough for me to go, oh, okay. Like, yeah, sweet if he thinks I, so. If he thinks that, that's that's sweet. Maybe that maybe I do have more footy in front of me. Yeah, absolutely. Especially coming from a bloke like him. Yeah. Incredible. Legend, legend of a guy. Absolute right. legend of the game yeah yeah um honestly terry lamb is is like forgotten goat in my opinion what he achieved and what he did at the doggies and that so yeah that, coming from one of him at like a club legend game legend it's, it just gives you that little spark you need you know yeah. just that just a tiny bit yeah definitely um okay so then 2012 rolls around and you make the finals this year you see benny barber's run so this is your second grand final what was that like running into that year yeah, so 2012, Desi had just come to the club. Mm. Um, yeah, he was um, come across from Manly early and um, pretty, again, pretty hard taskmaster. Like he was very um, detailed in everything he gave us and expected us to work really hard because that's what he did. Mm. Um, he set a really good example. So we went into the season in really good shape physically and also preparation-wise. I felt like we were in a really good position and um, everyone was uh, in a good headspace, I'd say, like really focused on the game and mm. – um, We'd had uh, he brought in a, a mind coach with him that um, he's still I think he's still with him um, at Manly now, uh, and he, he gave us some really good tools around how to prepare ourselves for for the game mm. and some really good um, things that we could use and yeah we just 
we applied everything that they gave us and, and we were getting results. Mm. And, you know, Benny Barber was one of those guys, like he was, he was doing it really well. It was incredible that year. Yeah. And he had some big shoes to fill. Like he was coming in for, um, for general, for Luke Patton, mm. who for so long was like a mainstay in that number Absolutely. one jersey for the Bulldogs and a really talented guy. Um, you know, one of the favorites for the Bulldogs. So it was a big, big ask for Benny, but he did a good job. Um, then, Any Desi stories of Desi's wildness? Oh, just a quirkiness. Like he'd come and tell us his stories and, um, you know, that some of them would fall flat. Like he'd tell us his jokes and <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'd wait yeah. for the punchline, but it'd never come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe it did come, we just missed it because it yeah, all went yeah. over our heads. Yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, he just he just had some quirkiness about the way he moved around and that. Mm. But he was like a hard worker and like I said, really detailed. Mm. And he'd always challenge you. If you want to question him about anything or go to him, his doors are open, but just go with information. Don't go empty-handed and just say hey des yeah whatever. Why is this wasting happening? his time kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so 2012 what, what, what is there any insights of benny barber that you saw that year where you were just you know something that he was doing or anything like that it was just a work on his game like yeah. he was putting a lot of work before and after training into positional stuff at fullback um defensive stuff uh his play his ball play mm. um i mentioned earlier about fullbacks that had really good execution when they mm. played those sweep lines and he was one of those guys that that did it really well. Um, yeah, it was it was a, a big year for him, but he had good guys doing work around him as well. Um, like Josh Reynolds had a big year. Um, Hodkinson as well, Trent Hodkinson. Hodkinson um, and then also um, Chris Keating had a big year. So there was, I can't remember, there was an interchange of halves between yep. those those three guys. James Graham, yep. he, was, he was distributing the ball from- Because yeah, he was a bit middle. of a ball playing forward, eh? Ball playing forward, probably the first guy that, that kind of implemented that um, at that time mm. um, as, a, as a middle forward mm. and then Cassiano kind of followed oh, and yeah, Cass had some Cassiano. really soft hands good skill like know. you know he was a, a talented talented Absolutely. footballer and um, guys like that that were doing really well so the grand final what I didn't play the grand final so oh, really this was yeah best year of football that I've enjoyed as a player I think mm. individually like I played some of the best footy I've played mm. um, but I didn't get to play in the grand final I got injured uh, six weeks out from the finals, and then I never got back in the team. Josh Jackson got Josh Jackson got a start, mm. and and that was it. I never got looking after that because our our seventeen was pretty solid, and Jacko yep. was killing it. He's a as we see now, he's a club captain and yep. Origin player. So I couldn't get back in. So I watched the grand final from the sideline, and it was um, no way. It was hard. It was pretty hard to watch because that yep. game was there for for the taking. But Melbourne just played it too well, and um, yeah, dis disappointing. Pretty gutted. Everyone was pretty gutted afterwards. They, mm. they felt like that was it was all heading towards that and mm. then just melbourne just executed their game plan so well do what melbourne GFD. do man like yeah. every there's very rarely other than the manly finals where they you know bruce is a little bit but usually they rock up to finals and play fucking yeah. good footy good footy yeah. um okay so what made you go back to the tigers what, what was that for um yeah well i was off contract after 2013 at the dogs mm. desi had I ch I chatted to him i was having a like a reason, reasonable season in 2013 and um des had kind of indicated maybe keeping me around another year and we had a really good working relationship um but then the tigers sort of popped up and said we'll give you maybe a couple of years so it was an, an extra year reasonably the same sort of deal mm. um and desi just sort of said to me he goes look he goes i'll amicably amicably part ways with you just mm. um go back and finish where you started uh, no hard feelings and you know it was pretty straight up and honest yep. with me. so this is what you want man yeah and i i appreciated that from him and i yeah i took the opportunity to go back yeah, where, where i started because you ended up you got a chance to captain the side didn't you yeah i, I got um when um there was i think uh woodsy had taken over the captaincy yep and then um he may have been off playing origin so one of the weeks he was off origin i got um i got handed the reins as, as skipper mm. didn't know what to do with the coin toss so i was like <laughs> oh, that's how little i've done of yep. this um yep. i think uh, gavin cooper was against uh, the cowboys gavin cooper was maybe in like his second game as skipper after jt so had no idea so Neither both of us were looking at each other going hey what do we do man like um yeah so you know it was i was, was proud proud moment to be able to, to skip the side and so you would have been you would have been there with all when all the Farrow drama happened. Yep. Correct. Yep. What was that like as a player? Your mates with him. Yeah. I mean, it's such a tough spot. You it know was, what to do. It was fun because I was playing hooker. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't fun at all. Like he. Um, that was dramatic. Yeah, he had a. Uh, it was a pretty pretty quick fallout with with JT and. Mm. Um, you know, I don't know the conversations that were had between them, but whatever happened, it it, it affected 
JT's decision to play Robbie and um, look, I still think Robbie's the best hooker the club's ever had. Mm. So yeah. um, I would be put, picking him ahead of me any day of the week. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was a weird time because I um, I had to play hooker, mm. um, which one I was never ever a comfortable hooker. Yep. But two, I'm in the middle of of whatever was going on between them. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You it feel was weird a bit about it. It was weird, yeah. yeah. And Robbie was sweet with me about it, but yeah. he was still, you know, bitterly disappointed that he wasn't getting to do every week what he wanted to do. And yep. He can always contribute to a team Bloody the oath. way he plays, right? So, um, but I will say that um, in my last few years of, of going through that, and it was my last year that mm. that all that all happened. I got to play with guys like Luke Brooks and Mitch Moses and James Tedesco, like Woodsy. Guy, I didn't mm. play with Woodsy my first; he hadn't debuted yet the first um, stint at the Tigers. But to be able to be distributing the ball to, to those guys was yeah. pretty cool, and you know they showed me a lot of love at the end of the year, and mm. I knew that it was a tough position for me to be in, and I appreciated that from them. Yeah, it's um, it's funny. As as you get older, you start to appreciate things that not that you didn't appreciate them when you're younger, but you get older and you start saying like, as you said, like you're distributing to Moses, to Tedesco, who could go down as the greatest fullback of all yeah. time. He's on the trajectory at least, um, or at least in the conversation. Relax, people. <laughs> relax. <laughs> Slate is still the guy. Relax. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you you appreciate that shit. Whereas yeah. when you're younger, you're kind of just like, folk, you're not selfish, but you're just so in, inwardly focused. Part of being a like a, a footy player or any athlete, mm. if you want to be up there, you got to be selfish at yeah, some point. And absolutely. it's okay to be that way mm. because the most driven people generally yep. have moments of that. that. Mm. But um, yeah, look at Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods. Yeah, I yeah. mean seriously. But you can you can get a balance of both. I think. Not I, that it, well, no, hey, just wait a sec. Not that I'm Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. I apologise to everyone listening. They got to, to where they got to for a yeah. big part of that reason. Focus you know, on themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the the choice to retire, you know, was it easy, hard? What was it like? Uh, I think it was it was easy for me to to pick that moment to retire. Mm. Um, it's still it's still hard. I think it's hard for anyone mm. to sort of actually go like you know pull the band out off and say okay I'm retiring. Yeah. Um, and it's really important. Something in my work that I was previously doing, like really important to be able to have control over when you when you finish. I think that's a really good indicator Absolutely. for how the transition sort of starts. Mm. So having that control was really important for me to say, okay, and I think I made a decision mid-2016. Um, the club said, do you want to do it like a press conference? I said, no, I don't want to fucking do that. I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll yep. just, um, I'll, if you want to put me up for media at the end of training, I'll just let them know then. Yeah. Let them know that I'm finishing up. So yeah. they just asked me and I said, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. At the end of the year. <laughs> um, They're like, oh, shit, really? <laughs> so, um, yeah, look, it was it was my, my decision. Um, I probably got ahead of maybe getting the tap of the shoulder i won't know so it doesn't really matter yeah yeah um but yeah i, I was i was okay with the decision mm. um doesn't mean it still wasn't you know like oh, oh shit i'm retiring yeah. yeah did you struggle the years after um there were moments when i when i felt that like i guess it was like a bit of an emptiness or um just purposelessness yeah purposelessness yeah, yeah. it's um it is it is a weird thing and um i was always grateful for the fact that i got to play it like i spoke about where i came mm. from to get there so I always let back out, you know, you got to do something not many people get to do and mm. you've got to do it for a long time. So just focus on being grateful for that. Mm. So that kind of pulled me back all the time. But yeah, you, you, the first year out of it, I was working at the club. So I seen the boys going to training every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The that was probably up. the worst thing for me yeah. to be that close to it that I couldn't do it. Bloody oath. Um, but I had good people around me. I was working in the NRL part-time as well in wellbeing. So the people that look after guys in transition were around me. So they're aware pretty, of everything that's yeah, going on. Yeah, so they didn't have to say much. They were very subtle about the conversations we had, but mm. it helped manage that. But yeah, first game, watching them win, sing the team song in the sheds and standing with the rest of the staff on the outside, going, yeah. oh, far out, this is shit. Yeah. I just want to be in there. 100%. You know, they're the moments that kind of creep up on you when you don't expect yeah. it. Round one and finals footy yep. sting me the most. Yeah, yeah. Where I'm like, oh, could you imagine just running out again? That yeah. raw, the boys, fuck you, yeah, we're doing this shit. Let's fucking go. Yeah. See, right now, like I'm... F <laughs> <laughs> you get... <getting, yeah, laughs> <sorry. laughs> <laughs> I get like, I get pumped up like the same as you hearing you think of, like talk about that. Yeah. yeah, fuck, it'd be great to be playing round one or to be you know in a finals match and that. But mm. um, I'm past the point of like missing it. Like I'm like... Yeah, yeah. Okay, like I'm just mean. like, yeah, man, this is on. This is cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm... I'm pump to see other blokes doing that now. yeah absolutely no it's um i'm probably i'm i think i'm phasing into that a little bit yeah, yeah. um in saying that it would just to run out in suncorp again oh yeah yeah That's it's, it's about, a man. really hard feeling to recreate yeah, man. yeah like absolutely ask anyone like if i asked you now what if, if you 
put it on a scale of one to ten, what did football give you out of one to ten in satisfaction or enjoyment? What was it for you? Yeah, well, fucking ten out of ten. Yeah, right. It's it's really hard for anyone else to go get that, um, like in a job. Like I'm not, and this is no disrespect. Yeah, yeah. working a, a job that it's they just love, a camaraderie. It's just, that's yeah. what I miss. Like the footy isn't something that I don't I don't miss getting bashed every fucking yeah, weekend. Yeah. It's just like the the mateship. It's the working towards something that's important. Um, and and being out in Suncorp. Yeah. In front of forty thousand people, Ooh. playing for the Broncos, mm. making your debut, like they're big moments. The smells sense. and the jersey and like, the, like yeah, it's it's pretty so tangible still for you now, yeah. right? So yeah. like, it's really hard to recreate that. Mm. But now I just, just make dick jokes on the internet. Yeah, but you got to follow me. <laughs> yeah. so. No, I just did a, an hour special on blokes how good looking they are. That's what I'm doing now. <laughs> no, I joke. Um, Oh, you got some. You got some pretty good looking blokes on that list, <laughs> mate. You? Great, some great sorts. Actually, Jordan Ricky's getting a lot of love from people in our office, uh, mate. Yeah. That is a good looking bloke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, his nickname to me is Pretty Ricky. Pretty Ricky. You yeah, know yeah. The, the, the 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 band Pretty Ricky? Uh, it's like an R and B band. It's pretty funny. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's great songs. Great songs. Um, ask all the boys this: favorite rapper of all time? Favorite rapper? Well, Tupac, because I was in that time where mm. you to be cool, you listen to Tupac. Yeah, so I just could recite. A lot of his songs. Yeah. I butchered a lot of his songs, but <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I would just sing along. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, favorite movie of all time? Ooh. Um, Shawshank's so cliched for a footy Mate, player. Mate, the it's, amount of people who say Shawshank is mental. It's a, it's a great movie. It is a great movie. Um, uh, is, it, is it Interstellar? Interstellar's a good movie. Interstellar's a good yeah. movie, but spoiler alert, turn it off if you uh, fucking haven't watched fucking Interstellar in the last 10 years. Um, the ending with like the books and that, like, bruh. It was so real. And then you're talking about translating messages through bookshelves and yeah, shit. Yeah, it gets a bit like outside the realms of us and probably into applied physics. I don't know, Justin Olin. I'm going to give Olin a call and get him to explain how you send a message through a bookshelf. Because <laughs> surely Olin, if anyone knows, the mad scientist, yeah, Olin knows. He'll know, he'll know. Um, bro, thank you so much for coming on, brother. Incredible career. And um, you know, thank you so much for what you do as a job and what you have been doing in your you know the mental health uh space and the cultural stuff really appreciate it brother thanks bro keep picking goals man boom done